age cohort on Thursday. Around three quarters of people over the age of 16 are now fully vaccinated, while 82% have received their first dose. Infectious diseases professor Dr Jack Lambert says it's very positive to see the rollout moving along to 12 to 15-year-olds. We've done really good with the vaccinations, but despite the va- all the vaccinations in the world, there's still going to be breakthrough infections. There's going to be people who have been vaccinated that carry the infections. So it makes perfect sense to now start moving down to younger populations who are less likely to end up in the hospital, but they are a source of ongoing transmission. So, so I think we're in a good place right now. And Gardaí in Dublin have seized almost €34,000 worth of cannabis jellies. They were recovered during a search in Bluebell yesterday. Almost €15,000 in cash was also recovered. It's two minutes past eight. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Make it a summer to remember with a family getaway to Spain, Italy, Portugal or Greece. Isolated showers tonight with some dry spells. Lowest temperatures of 9 to 12 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This this is News Talk. Yeah, you're welcome along. So we're talking with Brian O'Driscoll after 9 o'clock, but the hurling is taking centre stage now for a while. Eric Donovan with us later this hour for uh, more thoughts on Kelly Harrington. But on the hurling front, August 22nd, Limerick against Cork. Familiar foes, needless to say, but it's a first ever All-Ireland meeting between the pair. Very happy to say we are joined by Eddie Brennan and Noel Connors as well. Noel, I'm going to be honest here. We booked yourself and Eddie on Friday, assuming like surely both won't lose. But here we are. Is that, do you want me to comment on that? Or is, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know how to respond to that. It's all right. I'm just thinking listeners might be thinking, hang on, Eddie Brennan and Noel Connors, what a weird combination to put on after uh, the two defeats. But uh, we figured one of you had come through. So disappointing uh, weekend, obviously. Yeah, and you know what? It was, in many ways, it was probably expected in the war for a match that Limerick would probably be um, a smaller better um, and obviously they were on the day um, but the other match was probably 50-50 and that was a lot more intriguing um, yeah look I suppose going back to the Wolf match uh, the first 50 minutes were, were pretty good and pretty intense and obviously the, the four games in a row kind of took its toll after that um, I'm not saying that Warford would win the game if, if they were a bit fresh coming to the game but it certainly would have been a, a more interesting contest I think well, I was going to start with Kenny Cork, but I'm going to follow your lead here, Noel. We're going to go with this. We're going to go with Waterford uh, Limerick here, first of all, then. Uh, 125, 17 points Waterford. A uh, slightly surreal start with the bales of hay on the M7 and the delay and all that going on. And then, I guess, as, as you said, Noel, Waterford open with manic intensity, as you would expect. Like, let's lay down a marker. Let's go for this. It must have been a blow for them to know how much energy they'd expended and Limerick have weathered it to the point that they're 4-3 up Limerick at the water break. So, you know, psychologically, just for Waterford to have absolutely emptied the tank and still Limerick had somehow managed to weather it and go into the water break a point up must have, at the back of their minds, given them cause for concern, I would think. Yeah, and you know what? Over the last two games against Galway and obviously the last day against Tipperary, they had really good starts. Um, particularly the first 15 minutes where they got a lot of scores on the board and obviously that wasn't the case. Um, but look, you know, we come to expect that from Limerick. They're so well organised. Um, even looking back on some of the clips over the weekend and even before I came on the show, they have a phenomenal ability when they're in the tackle and even when Watford are, are on the ball, just to kind of flick the ball away, get an arm in. It was something that I suppose Eddie Brennan's team there were, were, were really well known for as well. It was just their ability to get the get the ball to ground and then get over the ball and win the ball and then give the right ball out. So um, their physicality was was is obviously well known at this stage, but the hurling ability is is just it's exceptional. Yeah, Limerick are at an interesting place, I think, Eddie, at the moment. So they're superb again. I mean, that's the short version for anyone who didn't see the game. Really, they are now playing with the assurance of All Ireland champions. So, like for Limerick, it's no longer about climbing the mountain or beating history or dealing with the hype or expectation for the first time. Like they've conquered all that, they've done all that. They're now almost just adding to a winning formula and refining it. And they're in that sweet spot as well of still being very, very hungry and wanting to do lots of new things and win more titles. And they just have all momentum and hitting new heights. I, I would think you've experienced that with Kenny when you're in that sweet spot and you're just building on previous success and everyone's very focused. They, they just seem to be in that place now where they're going to be very hard to stop for quite some time. 
Yeah, I think it's fair to say that's that's where they are right now. And and again, I'm, I, I suppose sometimes you have to go back to see why why that happened because this Limerick team have been coming for a considerable amount of time. They've had good uh, minor success, maybe just fell shy at minor level, and then they got those two under twenty one titles, and obviously then they made the big jump in eighteen and got the big one. So you kind of go back to nineteen, and again, I'm not trying to I suppose come in with the Kilkenny K- K- elements here, but I do think that. What happened to them in 2019 has created this monster. I think sometimes when you get over the line and you win an all Ireland final, there, there's a little bit of razzmatazz that comes with it. There's uh, obviously a county like Limerick has been starved of success. So there's, there's an understandable high. And maybe the appetite just was, was off a fraction, you know, in 19. Had there been water breaks in 19, maybe Limerick would have been able to address the rot of the first 20 minutes a little bit quicker. Mm. I don't know. But I ultimately think that, uh, and I commented at the time to people, I said, I said, Limerick are really hurt going out of Croke Park tonight. They are really hurt. I'd say a lot of them were looking at, you know, you know, an all earned final two of them stacked up. You have to make hay while it's there. And they literally got sent home packing. And I think if John Coyley needed something to maybe refocus this group, that was one where, you know, they got spanked that day. They had a lot of wides. They almost pulled it out of the bag. You know, maybe a controversial 65 could have rescued them. But it has created this focus now that is within the group. And I liken it to when we were coming, you know, into the all Ireland semi-final in 05. We had a little eye on Cork in the final. We wanted a bit of Cork at the time. And Galway just came up and clipped us. And it really hurt us. And it really sustained us for the next couple of years. Yes. So. I think in some ways we have we have created a little monster here that is going to sustain this Limerick group for maybe another year or two at least. I think that's a great point. I think I, I think that that as as you said that that rang totally true. No, uh, so like winning one All Ireland is not going to deal with the pain of that defeat. It's going to be a couple before they feel like they've almost put that one to bed. I suspect. Yeah, and I think I actually wrote something down here that was was quite interesting that Eddie said there, and, and the water breaks is the thing that it appears that. Paul Kinnurk and his backroom staff and whoever is obviously under statistics and watching the game and the under analysis are very much on point of what they're doing because it appears every 15 minutes they figure out what other teams are doing and they can change it in their favour. Mm. And we kind of saw that, you know, over the weekend where we were doing a lot right in the first 15 minutes. But then for the second, we'll say, quarter, they seem to kind of get to grips with what Watford were doing and change the game completely. Like, we didn't have time at 15 points to seven up which is a big swing when you consider where they were. And so a final word on Waterford then. Are they happy enough? It seems like they've made progress. Obviously last year you can't quibble with at all and another very decent showing you'd have to say this year round. Like is, is Liam Cahill locked in? Does it depend on what happens elsewhere? Like if Liam Sheedy calls it a day, does suddenly you get worried about keeping Cahill? Or, or what's the word on, on where Waterford are now going into next year? Yeah, I suppose it's it's a very hard one because over the last, we'll say, four years, we've had obviously three different managers. You obviously had Derek Lee, and you then had obviously Paul Fanning coming in for a year, and then you had Liam Cal, who's been there for the last two years, and he's done excellent work. The last thing I think Waterford need as a as a team and as a county is a complete change again, um, because the players are obviously if they're buying into the system, and things are working really well. Um, so what do we need is a bit of stability, um, and someone just kind of put their foot put their feet under the table for another year at, at least if not two mm. and, and kind of build a team um, we've obviously seen that over the last couple of years when you have the likes of John Coyley come in and taking a project on for a number of years and and obviously you know you're not going to win in Ireland the first year or two generally they're like a three to four year kind of uh, plan and we've seen that with even with the football and likes of Donegal etc so I think that what we need is a bit of stability at the moment and you know a bit of uh, energy coming into the, the new year yeah, he was non-committal, Liam Cal Eddie, after the game. Now, maybe most managers are non-committal afterwards. I would probably, if I was Waterford fan, be slightly worried in that they tend to be non-committal when they're losing. Often it's easier to say, look, I'll be back 100%. So he, he said he'll have to see. He's had a great two years and he said, it's hard to know yet. We'll just have to sit down and talk to everybody. So who knows, he may stay. Uh, he may not. You feel it's kind of important, as Noel says, for him to hang around for another year and, and build on the work he's done. Uh, it is because um, look, and, and, and I suppose I, I, no one needs to tell you know know all about this. But I think when Watford get to a bigger day and they make those breakthroughs, you know they've often you know had little difficulties the following year. Whereas this year they have stacked that up, which is a real positive. And I, and I think what the big thing is when you look at that team from last year that started with Liam Cal, there's been a huge amount of changes and a huge new faces coming in. So he has really built a strong squad there. And 
And like I said, um, when you have a little bit of continuity there and familiarity, that augurs well going forward. It mm. just means, you know, when you supplement that with Tyke de Burka and, you know, one or two more coming in next year, that, that they're in a good place. But I think understandably, look, at the back of it all, obviously, Liam Cal has brought uh, a lot of the Tipperary squad at the moment, a good few of the younger crew, through a minor All-Ireland and an under-21 followed by an under-20. Mm. So if, you know, we take away the Waterford side of it, you say, okay, is Liam Cal the man to bring forward that group? Because that Tipperary group are probably a team in transition now. They need a little bit of building and they need, you know, again, a three-year project maybe to get them back up to steam. But they're definitely the raw material is there. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So I suppose there might be a little bit of a cat and mouse there, but yeah. definitely I, I would agree with Noel. I think if you're Waterford County Board, you need to nail that down fairly quick because what you don't want is a new setup. Because I, I, I would presume if Sheedy says, look... I, 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 a good time to leave it and, and you know he goes off with nothing to prove I presume Cahill's pretty close Noel to top of the Tip County Board's list Yeah you know what it's an interesting one because obviously Tip kind of you know they always kind of go for their own but there's generally a transitional period for most people so if it's kind of like an Aim No Shea into a Liam Sheedy and obviously they don't have in previous years where generally there's kind of a, a selector slash coach in there for a year or two in advance of them getting the management job on their own so there's been great, I suppose there's been great success in certain clubs in, in Tipperary and Ronald Dara Egan been, you know, exceptional at what he does. So I think that he has a really, really interesting kind of space and time as well on his hands to see does he want to take on the role or put his name forward for the role. Mm. Because apparently what he's done up in the club has been exceptional as well. Right. So there's plenty of, you know, opportunities and options in Tipperary. So I wouldn't be too concerned about... Um, what tip are going to be like in the next year or two. Okay. If I could just throw in Joe on that, sorry. I, I think it's interesting because Liam Cal was almost nailed on. It was real 11th hour uh, when this was decided and Liam Sheedy came in. So there's a little bit of that there. So it's if, if it were to become that Liam Sheedy is in the picture, then you just wonder, you know, <laughs> is there any little bit of uh, bad blood there or like that? I think it's just something that is... I suppose at the backdrop of the two. Right. That's okay. not me trying to stir the pot. No, no, no. Sorry, I, I thought you were interrupting. In, I thought you were interrupting. There's no way I can any person do that. <laughs> I thought you were interrupting to announce your candidacy for the position. I didn't know why you were coming in for there. Uh, I, I, yeah, that'd be that'd be unbelievable. Destroy them from within, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, one quick one: the Peter Casey red card. Like, this is a big price to pay if you miss a final. I, I don't know are they planning to appeal it or not, Eddie. What's your read on that situation? Um, yeah, there's a few little bits and pieces to it. I think it was. I think it was. It was. It was actually amazing that the the umpires seem to be very certain, which is great to see because you you, you don't want to ever see people guessing so they seem to be very clear and I think John Keenan was you know was was uh, was obviously going with that um I felt even myself coming into it that that Limerick because of the narrative that was out there over the last couple of years some Limerick player who missed times of tackle was probably going to pay a price at some stage but again you know how much contact was there but I suppose the reality is if it, and I'm gutted for Peter Casey if you missed an all learned in that fashion or any player but I suppose the reality is if you do shun forward or you do nod forward, you're now putting somebody in a, in a position where they have to make a decision. And it reminds me, the irony of it is, I suppose, it's a bit like, you know, the guy involved, Conor Gleeson was involved in an incident with Patrick Horgan in 17. And, you know, you say, do you need to get involved at that stage of the match when it's over? You probably don't. And I'm sure, look, Peter Casey is low tonight. But I, I think John Kiley will have a good look at it. And if there's any little avenue at all, he'll probably go with it, you know. But mm. um, I don't know. I, yeah. I suppose the camera views are a long way off to be really, really conclusive. So to turn to Sunday then, Kilkenny 132, Cork 137 after extra time, obviously uh, the equalising Kilkenny goal coming on 74 minutes, 15 seconds. Um, Tim O'Mahony lost the ball, dream pass, Pora Welch, Adrian Mullen goal and... You just thought Kilkenny are going to pluck this out of the fire somehow, but Cork rallied and rallied really well. You would have to say to win extra time uh, comfortably, no. And listening to everybody talking in advance of this game, there was definitely a sense this was going to be closer. There was obviously a real uh, sense that Cork had a goal threat and that their pace could hurt Kilkenny for sure. But everybody kept coming back to this question mark of, and you can use whatever adjective you want, but steel or intensity or physicality or that bit of grit or like winning dirty ball just this sense of 
you know, would Cork really be able to match Kilkenny in the fight? And most people I heard came down on the side of Kilkenny in that conversation. I don't know where you were in that, but like Cork answered a lot of questions here on Sunday. Yeah, and I was kind of sitting on the fence, I suppose, last week myself on this. Um, and I suppose the more you like, it's, it's obviously in hindsight, it, it's, it becomes a lot more obvious. But, you know, and I kind of mentioned this last week that you look at Cork's success and, and Kim Kingston said well before the match, you know, like that Cork aren't used to playing in Go Park and and so on and so forth. But like they've been in, in, in a lot of like under 20s and minor uh, Munster finals, I don't know, finals. And I think actually if they win tonight against Wofford, I think they're in now the minor under the minor All Ireland, the under twenty All Ireland, yeah. and and the senior Ireland. And an interesting story I heard a couple of years ago, maybe a year or two, for anyone that that watches underage, that the Tony Farsell is obviously one of the most important, would say, tournaments coming up when you're under fourteen, and that's kind of the main one where you want to make your squad. Um, and a couple of years ago, Cork didn't actually enter a squad, and I was kind of curious enough to to wonder why that was the case. So apparently, rather than picking 30 guys from, what have they, 259 clubs in Cork, they decided to run their own tournament. And I was kind of saying to myself, do you know what, that's actually a very, very kind of shrewd and smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. So rather than kind of marginalising a small group of people that at that particular moment in time, because obviously size is quite important when you're 14, they're bringing, we'll say, three, four, five, six times that uh, in numbers to a tournament that they run themselves. Right, that's very interesting. Yeah, so I heard that, yeah. They've got their act together. If they get their act together with that number of clubs, then, you know, things get a bit dangerous. Where, where were you, Eddie, on, on Cork and that sense of being able to match Kilkenny in the fight for starters yesterday? Yeah, well, I think that was probably the, the area that Kilkenny would have looked at and said, this is probably our, our, our big our big strength is that there's, there's there's good resilience in the guys. They won't throw it in and we're kind of hoping that, look, maybe coming down the straight, if it's a point or two either way, that might be enough to get us through. And mm. I suppose it, you'd love to have been only a point down when, when Adrian Mullen got that goal. But Kilkenny did have goal chances. Um, you know, Adrian Mullen had one on Cody. You know, there was chances slipping around there. So if they're more clinical, you know, particularly Adrian Mullen's first one where Patrick Collins gets turned over, you just go, oh, go in there, just just go in closer to the goal and be really clinical. And it's easy for me to say that, look, you know, we're looking in now, Adrian Mullen probably just, just fired it off. But look, on Cork, I, you know, I felt that the psychological throwdown that was put to Cork, and, and it's something that has been, Noel said it there, look, it's something that's probably been levelled against Cork over the last few years that, you know, they, 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 they didn't grind it out. Mm. And to be fair to them, if ever there was a test for, Patrick Horgan even and Tim O'Mahony, you know, Hoggy comes back out, misses a, the first free of extra time. And again, I, what what's, what jumped out at me was they were out quickly for extra time and there was actually smiles on a few of their faces and you just went, yeah, look, I, I, I think maybe that young, fearless, new blood that has come into Cork that are playing with, fe with no fear whatsoever, mm. you know, they have no hang-ups and they just probably, you know, I'm sure Hoggy and Dubai play said, listen, we've been here before, so let's throw off the handbrake and have a go. And they did, they finished with a plum. And, and I think they passed that psychological test that has been levelled at Carl teams in the last couple number of years. Yeah, and you know, it's amazing. I just I just watching the highlights again this morning in advance of work today and they put the 15 up and the, the pen picks without the helmets. They look like a minor team, honestly. Like, yeah. with just, it was just like a couple of ringers thrown in, like Patrick Horgan, the old man up front. <laughs> Do you know? Like they actually just look like boys and, and you forget how young they are. Because I thought, Eddie, when the first couple of minutes in the match, like we knew Cork have their game plan they're going to stick to it but I mean Kilkenny pressing them off puck outs and turning them over I think they were 6-3 on turnovers very early on and picked off a few early points and to be fair like it's still going to be a concern against Limerick because Limerick will go after them in that department but I thought geez they're, they're in trouble here like Kilkenny this is going to be kind of old school toughness this short puck out business it's not tested enough to pull this off in Crow Park under serious pressure and whatever they did and you probably have a better feel than me they got to grips with that, they calmed it down and, and they stuck with it and, 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 you know, Kilkenny weren't able to turn them over in the same way as the match went on. Yeah, they did. Kilkenny engaged them up there early on and, and, and I think what was interesting, and again, it was something I would have known myself at the time, and said, they're actually persisting with this. Yes. They are continuing to persist with this and what they done was, interestingly, they put four first receivers almost across the 21 um, and Patrick Collins continued with it. They were happy to play ball. It was like as if they were trying to draw Kilkenny out because they knew Kilkenny were going to obviously keep their shape relatively at the back and by giving way there you have Parik Will straight away was 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 sitting in the in that deep kind of pocket. 
So it was like, you know, as if they wanted Kilkenny to come and hunt them. And at times it was a bit like soccer. They played possession over and back. So it was a good mark of them that they stuck at it because Kilkenny did ask serious questions of them very early. And you say, look, maybe if a goal goes in, then quickly the strategy changes. But obviously then I think when you look at between the, the water break and half time, Cork started to find those holes higher up the field. They started to find space in front of uh, Hoggy, in front of Shane Barrett and guys like that. So it was almost that they drew the Kilkenny tacklers higher up into their own side of the field and then obviously launched it over. And, and maybe, look, that's the, the, the thinking of maybe the Christy O'Connor influence that's in there. He's particularly has worked a lot in that. But look, the the other one there, a stat there, look, I, I, Sean Flynn does, does stats there regularly and I think they're brilliant. It's really good, interesting take of matches. Kilkenny had a, an 84% success, you know, success rate on balls that were drove in from midfield. So the higher platform, Kilkenny got the balls and then fed it inside. They were getting great joy out of that. But when Cork actually forced Kilkenny to hit from deeper back in their own half, back around be behind their own 45, it went all the way down to 70% turnovers for Cork on that long ball to the square. And I think Kilkenny probably tried to do that and it maybe played into Cork's hands a little bit towards the second half because the one place that I didn't want to see TJ Reid was back up high in our own defence and TJ Reid ended up almost on our own full back line in the first place. Yeah. When you have a guy like him with the mileage, you need him maybe closer to goal. Yeah, and like closer to goal, he was having some joy as well when he'd pop up in certain positions. Yeah. So what chance Cork against Limerick then? No, like how do you see this game? Where can Cork hurt them? Where do you think Limerick will really fancy their chances and their opportunities? Um, yeah, but you know what? There's actually a really interesting point and before we even go into that match. I think that Cork got a lot right. I think they yeah. got a lot of tactics choice. You know, they scored, what, 11 points from the bench. Kilkenny scored one. Generally, that's the opposite. Yeah. I, I thought that, you know, it was a complete miss, mix match in terms of, like, you know, obviously Kilkenny with aerial ball. And I'd say Kilkenny felt themselves that they could win it, I thought. Downey at full back was phenomenal. I thought he was exceptional against Dublin. I thought he was brilliant again the weekend. But also... And this is probably something that we didn't even discuss before. Is there was a lot of uh, pressure, not just on on uh, Cork in general, but like a lot of pressure on the players because they were the ones that were crying from the rooftops to try and get Kingston and the Rock back in. Yes. And and, and and like you know what? If if anything, that steel and that grit and and probably why got over the line is the fact that there was pressure on those players because they wanted them in there and they wanted them back in there in the first instance. And if it didn't work well, then the whole narrative of, you know, player power and, and so on and so forth. So that was an interesting factor. And I think that definitely fed into why Cork had that bit of edge and steel in, in the... But even on that, defense. Noel, I think it was brave of Kingston. I think it was really yeah. brave of Kingston. 100%. 100%. Mm. Sorry, and by the way, ridiculous to me not to mention Kingston off the bench. I mean, that was just extraordinary, Eddie. Yeah, it was. It was phenomenal. Uh, you know, I, I suppose... You, 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 you laugh at the dynamic of that even saying, you know, <laughs> going home to the, the mother or whatever. It's just brilliant, isn't it? It's a great little story. Yeah. But oh, actually, I saw, I saw your tweet. Your tweet when <laughs> your tweet was beautiful. Oh, it, was, it was great. You were, picture, yeah, you were picturing the scene in the car. Yeah, you could just imagine, you know, maybe. And I'm sure now at this stage, they definitely don't travel together. But you just laugh at that side. And that's brilliant, I suppose, about sport because... That is the, the dilemma that, that every club team and all underage squads, like you, you have your own young fella in there and if he's not performing, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And I just think it's it's a really, it's a tough one to get right and it's a, it's a really brave of Kingston to go in there because I think if I had two or a young lad involved in the county squad, I don't think you'd want to put that pressure on him to one, from one point. And then the question will always, or the, the, that will always be possibly leveled at, at Kieran Kingston. And in fairness, he has managed it well, but I'll tell you this much, I wouldn't be starting him either if I thought it was going to get even five <laughs> points off him on the bench the next day. So well, it was, uh, that's, that's, that, and, that brings on to Joe, sorry, uh, yeah. the strength of the Cork bench, which Noel highlighted. Yeah, for sure. Well, Eddie's treat was, I can just picture Shane Kingston sitting in behind the wheel of the car tonight. <laughs> and as the father sits in, he hands him the Man of Match award and says, put on the belt there and hold that like a good man. <laughs> which is a nice thing. <laughs> Although it was funny, like even Kieran, and this is where like winning, winning solves everything. So you can imagine his reaction. Yeah, yeah. If, if they had lost and uh, Shane comes off the bench and scores seven, then suddenly why didn't you start him is a very different question. It's like, you got this wrong. Yeah. So, But he's able to laugh and go, sure, it gave him the kick up the ass he needed and it's all yeah. laughs and all smiles. It just, it just tells you just the margins are so, so 
tin and and it can go either way like you know so and again i have to say sorry it was an accidental cork background to have up here behind me tonight so <laughs> <laughs> so it happens to be the one room i'm in is red and white but anyway <laughs> uh so no against and look this is a, a, a short enough question because we'll tease this out over the next couple of weeks but but cork against limerick are there any er- obvious areas where you think limerick might be a touch worried or you know um, without wanting to write off the all-ireland final there's probably just this pretty general sense now that limerick can't be stopped yeah, but the finals are always strange and different. You know, like there can be, obviously we saw it again and it was towards the latter end of the, the match to send them off. And we saw like the effects of that when unfortunately Richie Hogan got set off against Tipperary in, in 2019. So like finals are different and, and they bring a different atmosphere. And, you know, the whole different dynamic of finals and there's obviously going to be 40,000 people in the stand. So that's all going to add to it as well. So I don't think it'll be as straightforward as most people think. Um, Cork, you know, they always kind of have the sense of confidence. We won't say arrogance. There's probably a fine line between both, but they have the sense of confidence. And as I said earlier on in the open, is like those guys have won a lot underage, and and they're used to being in finals and semi-finals. So it's not as if they're not used to the big occasion, the big day, the whole way from, we'll say schools and colleges, the whole way up now from minors under 21. So they've been there and they've done a lot of stuff mm. and done a lot of stuff quite well. Um, but again, like it's hard to look past Limerick without trying to overshadow what they've done over the last, yeah. you know, two or three years. The interesting thing for me over the weekend against Watford, all six forwards scored and both midfielders. So the expectation is you always want your forwards scoring, all six of them scored and the midfielders. Mm. Looking back on Watford scores, three, their, three out of their six scored, one midfielder, and Jamie scored when he went inside, so um, didn't score from midfield. So it goes to show, I suppose, you know, the intensity that they bring to the game but also their, their ability to score. Yeah. Eddie, expectations are always huge in Kilkenny. Does this by... Um, sorry, I don't know how to phrase this, but it's any ridiculous. Like, for, can I just say, I don't think Brian Cody should be under any pressure, really. But uh, yeah. does this, like, calm any sense of, oh, you know, time for, you know, change or do something different? Because uh, another Leinster, young players coming through, and, uh, you know, we're seeing the style of play evolving. Does this, like, keep... The natives happy, or, or will there be kind of quibbles around Kilkenny now? Another semi final defeat. You could have a bit of both, really, to be honest, Joe. It's hard to know, but you know, you'd say the plus is that, you know, maybe after the 2019 All Ireland final, we, we'd have said we were in, in serious trouble in terms of, you know, what's coming through. And now we find ourselves, look, um, two Leinster titles in the bag. It's it, their importance because that gives young lads confidence. But definitely, I think, uh, you know, there has to be a sense of realism and saying, look, it is progress. It is young lads getting their goal. Uh, You know, there's a core lads there probably. The problem is the core lads that are on the 30 plus side and they are significant players. Um, I was fierce disappointed for Richie Hogan yesterday. I definitely thought there was more in him. I I would have expected him in, you know, as someone who's capable. I don't know what his injury situation is. But that's the problem is that you have, you know, maybe Killian Buckley, Connor Fogarty, TJ and Richie Hogan are important fellas. And I think even, even Connor Fogarty done so well yesterday up until, you know, the, the, the gas, you know, just went dry on him. He was brilliant in the first uh, 45, 50 minutes of that game. He was phenomenal. But they are the, the, the couple of guys. So there's probably a gap between our youth and our more exer- experienced guys. So mm. it's um, it's that. And uh, yeah, look, I think there's the, the, there has to be a bit of straight talking too. I think definitely Kenny... It's brilliant to get two Leinsters, absolutely, but we definitely have a, have a nice bit of work to do because um, you'd say maybe in some facets of the game. And look, they were brilliant. They hung in and they almost snatched it. But um, I'm not sure is that group of Kilkenny lads, would they be ready to take on Limerick in another and final just yet? No. I think Cork are in a real good place to take them on. And, and is that like a, just the standard of player coming through critique or is that a critique of management? I ah, know. I think it's, look, the one thing Brian is going to do, Brian, Brian wants, you know, comfort himself and say well I'm safe or anything like that that's one thing Brian Cody doesn't do yeah. he'll look at himself first and foremost and then he'll look at his players because he always will look at his players and he'll and he'll, he'll, he'll comb the county as well you know I think he has to go now and go see can he find a few new lads but you'd, you'd have to say look for years you know even when I was playing you would always be looking at the minors and, and Noel touched on it there the, the Tony Forrestal team the Nina Co-op team and someone would go hey you should see A coming through he is a serious joke and Richie Hogan was one of those guys. TJ was one of those guys. Adrian Mullen probably coming through Kearns. And the number of those guys that we are getting in Kilkenny is, is, has dried up a little bit. So yeah. that's, that, that's it. Is we're not okay. producing maybe those quality 
forwards of, of, of you know, the likes of the Richie Hogan's and the TJs. OK, listen, that's great stuff. There's a couple of tweets and I won't get through to them all. I see one here from Barry in Wexford. Uh, ask Eddie, when is he taking over Wexford? She's all, <laughs> all these job offers. Tip and Wexford want them. Any, 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 any comment on Wexford there, No. No. <laughs> uh, no. Noel Connors, Eddie Brennan, super stuff, lads. Great analysis. Thanks, Emil. Thanks, Joe. Brilliant. All the best, Joe. See you all. See you, Eddie. All the best. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Auto Mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie At Permanent TSB, we know your first home isn't always your forever home. Times change, families grow, and now you're looking for something a little more permanent. We're helping you make that move with new lower rates for second-time buyers, meaning you'll see real savings every single month. That's permanent support. Book an appointment today at permanenttsb.ie.